You're watching New York State Legislative Report with Senator Tom O'Mara. I'm Julia Locandy. Today, the senator and I are going to talk about Medicaid and some community issues. How are you, Senator? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> yes, thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, as an assemblyman, you served on the Republican Task Force for Medicaid Reform. Yeah. And you've been very involved in examining ways to root out fraud and waste. So tell us what the general problem is. Well, I think the, the biggest, there is, some, there is fraud as part of it. You know, we've got a $54 billion a year program in New York, all funds combined, federal, state, and local um, funds. So there's a lot of fraud in it, but I think more bigger part of it is uh, mismanagement, uh, mismanagement of the whole program. We need more coordinated care of, uh, of this and, and looking at the fraud uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of this. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of abuses uh, in the system that um, um, when an individual is um, treating with, a, with a, you know, multiple physicians, um, going to different sources, sometimes getting uh, multiple prescriptions uh, for things, uh, and that builds to the to the whole added cost to the system. You know, with with we have the largest Medicaid program in the country, um, dollar wise, and we spend more per recipient than any other state does. Uh, I think it's like two and a half times the uh, national average per recipient. So, having the largest system, we should have some economies of scale. You'd think that we would get, but it, there's no management of it whatsoever. Um, we need to have uh, more standardized um, managed care so that it's coordinated care. So that the individual that, that needs um, the care is getting it from um, a source that knows what all the treatment is going on and not haphazardly having the, the patient go from, from provider to provider and not having a coordinated basis, particularly with uh, disease management of chronic conditions like, uh, like diabetes and those types of things that are uh, uh, really lifelong conditions that, that manifest itself in, in many different ways and, and aggravated um, um, conditions um, when you don't have coordinated care. You know, we've been successful um, in my home county of Chemung uh, with uh, the leadership of our county executive, Tom Santulli, uh, who's been a, a leader in Medicaid reform uh, in the state. Um, got a pilot program um, to set up a, a managed care clinic um, for Medicaid recipients uh, in Elmira. Uh, that's a, coming up on a year old now that that's been in implementation. And it's, it's, it's not mandatory, unfortunately. We wanted to have it mandatory that all Medicaid recipients had to go to this clinic rather than the haphazard um, treatment of uh, various providers or the utilization of emergency rooms, which is the most uh, expensive uh, uh, form of uh, treatment for, for common uh, ailments. You know, when you've got uh, somebody taking an ambulance ride to the emergency room for, uh, for a stomach ache or, you know, things like that. That's just, uh, um, it's abusive. Uh, it's a waste of taxpayers' dollars. And we want to make sure that, that the individual that is entitled to Medicaid gets it and gets the good care that, the, that they should get and gets it in a coordinated way that, that, that helps them uh, and will ultimately be less cost to the whole system. Now, to, to figure out the whole utilization, I've been an advocate for, a, it's actually a local company in Horseheads uh, called Salient. It's a software company. They do data mining software, uh, which now is being utilized by the Medicaid Inspector General to, uh, to look at all the data, the millions and millions of transactions in the Medicaid database uh, every year to find out where the utilization is. Um, they can compare providers with the same types of um, um, conditions on, on how they treat and what their costs uh, are and find out who's an outlier. Um, uh, what the what the average cost of these is, and there's some that, that are outliers. Why are they outliers? It's not always fraud. Sometimes it's just it's just sometimes it's it's appropriate. Um, sometimes it's fraud. And sometimes it's just uh, um, mismanagement uh, um, by a particular provider or by a, an individual. But they can look at it by individual. And now the Medicaid Inspector General's office is using that. Um, I'd like to see that used um, not just by the the Medicaid Inspector General, but by the Department of Health uh, as a whole. Uh, in managing the Medicaid program. You know, it's a over 40-year program now that really has not had the appropriate management um, to, to handle uh, the number of transactions. Uh, it's just been a bill-paying mechanism, and uh, the way we've gone about uh, dealing with it in state government in, in recent years has been to just cut reimbursements to providers and hospitals, which is really causing a bind on those providers uh, and, and makes them you know, not want to provide these services at all. Um, the Medicaid clinic uh, in Elmira is a, is a good example. It seems to be working very well 
um, and uh, it's got somebody that uh, it's on staff that uh, can act as a primary care physician for these Medicaid recipients, and they and they get a good, solid, coordinated care. Right. Not everyone who is, as you said, on Medicaid needs to be on, and it's, it puts a strain on local governments. Yeah. It really seems that um, Medicaid is took front and center stage in this year's budget, the governor get, uh, coordinating the redesign team. Yeah, the Medicaid redesign team uh, was an effort to, to finally um, try to go beyond just the cutting of reimbursements to get a to get a handle on, on how this is being done. And, and I think the governor went about it in a good way to get the, the major players involved together to work on a solution because uh, um, we need their input. They're the ones that deal with this day in and day out, whether it's uh, uh, the counties that administer the program on a local level, it's the hospitals or the physicians that provide the services, um, that to restructure the program. And, and we made an effort to start to restructure it this year. There is still some of the cost reimbursement reductions, um, which is the easy way to, to control the cost. But um, I think getting everybody to work together is going to make a difference in, uh, in how we actually restructure the delivery of, of Medicaid. Um, and we do need to make sure that, um, that those that are entitled to it receive it and also make sure that we're stewards of the taxpayers' dollars and make sure that, that those that aren't entitled to it um, don't get it. Um, you know, we took major steps backwards uh, under the, uh, the uh, Spitzer and Patterson administration by uh, um, doing away with um, a lot of, uh, doing away with the simple face-to-face -face interview like we're having here when you go in and apply for Medicaid benefits. It doesn't have to happen anymore. Um, there's no background financial checks that are done. It's just the applicant filling out an application um, with the right information to prove that they're eligible on this piece of paper and there's no further investigation into that other than a, a you know a perjury statement at the bottom of the form they sign which uh, which is uh, you know not a big deterrent for uh, providing false information so uh, you know we, we would like to see uh, um, fingerprinting we'd like to see uh, um, a good identification card um, to, to make sure that the individual that's receiving the services uh, uh, is that individual um, and does that uh, I would like to see drug testing for recipients um, many people uh, have uh, uh, have a job that uh, requires drug testing um, for that. Uh, here somebody is getting an entitlement uh, for this and, and I think there's, there's rampant abuse uh, in those regards uh, uh, for individuals that are getting an entitlement such as Medicaid and other types of uh, entitlements um, should be subjected to, to drug tests and, uh, and, and have to you know, make sure that they're not uh, wasting their money somewhere else. Right. During the budget process, thousands of recommendations came into the redesign team. And do you think that um, what the end result, do you think that it went far enough? No, it didn't go far enough, but it's, just, it's a, certainly a first step or, or a good step in the right direction. Certainly not the, not the first step, but, you know, we need to keep moving it along. And this is a, it's a, it's a 900-pound gorilla that... Uh, we're not just going to change overnight, and we've got to get the focus changed towards long-term restructuring of the program uh, so, that, so that we can contain the cost of this program so that we can provide it. Otherwise, it's going to implode on its own weight, and uh, it's going to bankrupt uh, the state and counties. As it, we see the burdens it places on county tax rolls, uh, it's caused uh, tax increases. Uh, that's the major mandate that uh, um, counties and have to deal with as well as other state mandates that, that's a whole other issue of, uh, of mandate relief uh, that's required and we're working on and the tax cap for property taxes that, uh, that we supported in the Senate that I voted for, uh, but we need to get the mandate relief. Um, part of that is Medicaid reform and, and other reliefs for uh, local governments to be able to live within a cap um, to, to control property taxes. Right, so still a long way to go. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a long time to uh, get this under control. Okay, I want to move on now. Uh, this week is National Volunteer Week, and I understand that some volunteer firefighters um, were got together last weekend to talk about the decline in uh, volunteers. Yeah, it was a, uh, a statewide effort um, to talk about the um, to recruit new volunteers because our our volunteer course are, are dwindling. I think that's a lot to do with our society today, and as busy as people are, um, you know. Younger families, uh, individuals have have so much going on, working uh, dual income families or or working more than one job and and with children. Um, there's so many activities for kids now that you're constantly running the kids around from thing to thing and and it cuts into the time and the ability to be able to uh, 
to volunteer. A lot of people, they love to volunteer. They like to make the commitment to their community uh, and do that. And it is just such a valuable service because uh, if we had to pay for all these services in our communities, uh, talk about property tax increases. I mean, it would be, it would be astronomical. Uh, and, and so last week, um, volunteer fire departments uh, and ambulance corps did open houses uh, over the weekend. Um, to, to build awareness of, of the opportunities that there are to, to work on, work in there and give back to your communities. Uh, and it is a, it, you know, most people that do it very much enjoy it and do it because of that. Uh, but it's, it's, um, it's an activity uh, that really provides a, an excellent service to our communities that is vital to our, uh, particularly in rural communities that, uh, that just don't have the, do not have the wherewithal to have a, a professional paid um, uh, fire department or ambulance corps. Right, absolutely. Um, you are participating in some Senate programs to recognize some distinguished members of your community. Um, the first one, you are right now asking for recommendations for a veteran, for Veterans Hall of Fame. Yes. We're going to, we do, a, in the Senate, there's a, a Veterans Hall of Fame uh, every year. Uh, it gets done. This is my first year in the Senate, so my first opportunity uh, to do this. And we're taking applications that you can um, get the information off my website. Um, which is omara at nysenate.gov, uh, and get that. We're going to, you know, go through the, the reviewing of those and, and probably make a very difficult decision on which one to choose. Right. Um, but to to honor uh, a veteran that has uh, that has given a, a, a great sacrifice to our country. Right, and um, you have already taken nominations for a woman of distinction. Tell us uh, what type of community leader do you look for in a woman of distinction? Well, it's 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 a wide ranging uh, thing. You know, we've got um, many um, applicants in already that have been um, um, nominated by by people in their communities, and uh, you know, we're looking for for someone that has certainly served their community, um, been an outstanding leader um, in in many different ways, and. And we're going through that review process. We have to have our submissions in next week. So uh, it, it is uh, tough when you get them all in and, and compare them side by side. There are, you know, major differences in, in the individuals and what their accomplishments have been. But they're all great community leaders. So making the ultimate choice of, uh, of, of who it's going to be is, is a difficult choice, but uh, um, one that uh, I enjoy uh, um, going through and, and making that decision to, uh, to honor a, a woman of distinction in, the, in my district. Right. And really quickly, um, just to go back to the veterans, the Senate has passed a lot of um, legislation this year that supports military personnel. Um, yeah, we do. We, we're always trying to provide uh, uh, added benefits uh, and recognition for our veterans because, uh, you know, we, the freedom that we enjoy uh, in this country is directly um, related to, uh, to our military, um, to what our military has done in the past and what it continues to protect our freedoms uh, going forward in the, the, the wars that we are currently involved in uh, around the world. Um, it, we just have uh, added and, and, and great need um, and respect um, for our military. Right. So, uh, again, you are looking for a veteran to enter into the Veterans Hall of Fame. Yes. They can go onto your website, omera.nysenate.gov, mm -hmm. and fill out a short biography of their civilian yes. and military. Yeah. And, okay. and that uh, award ceremony is going to take place on Flag Day, um, June 14th of, uh, of uh, two months away. So it's coming right up. Great. Thanks so much for being Thank with you. us, Senator. For any additional information, you can log on to the Senator's website, omera.mysenate.gov.